how he's been working in my life. And so if you don't know much about who I am or what I'm doing, I'm in physical therapy school, I'm in grad school, so I'm a little bit older than them, but still don't really consider myself a real adult, I guess. Um, but yeah, so this past winter, I went over to Jamaica and was able to go on a Jamaica uh, physical therapy missions trip. And it was amazing while I was able to be out there because we got to work with uh, patients that had strokes, patients that had different neuro injuries, and it was all student-led, so it was really cool just to be able to work out there um, and just be able to see different patients and see how uh, the missions field is integrated into physical therapy. So with that, uh, every morning before we would even uh, start physical therapy, all of our patients would come in. We'd start with a Devo, and then we'd start with uh, praise and worship, then we'd all pray, and then we'd start uh, with treatment. So that was really cool for me, and that was uh, this past winter. Um, while there, we worked with different students from other campuses. So I got to work with people from uh, Arcadia University in Philadelphia, I believe, and then Duke University uh, from North Carolina. And so while I was there, I was talking to some of my friends that I made out uh, in Jamaica, and one of them was encouraging me. I was saying, you know, like, hey, does, uh, does NAU, where you go to school, do they have a Bible study there on campus? I was like, uh, no, they don't have a Bible study there. Why do you guys have a Bible study there? Like, yeah, like, I help run the Bible study at our campus. It's like, well, that's really cool. Yeah, we don't have one. She's like, why not? Why don't you start one? I don't know. Why don't I start one? And so uh, she kind of encouraged me with that. And it was really cool just to see that through this small interaction and through this connection that I made randomly out in Jamaica on this PT mission trip, um, through her encouragement, uh, I started a Bible study at NAU. And so NAU is in downtown Phoenix, uh, or at least that's where my campus is at. And in downtown Phoenix, uh, it's the Phoenix Biomedical Campus. So if you ever go into a Diamondbacks game and you're on 7th Street and you're uh, passing by Van Buren, there's a big bronze building and it has U of A and NAU on it, and that's where I'm at. So on that campus, there's uh, med students, there's pharmacy students, there's physical therapy, occupational therapy, athletic training, and some nursing students from uh, ASU. Uh, but yeah, so all these students here are on this biomedical campus. Um, <clears throat> but what was really cool uh, is that we started this Bible study, and I was not expecting anything, honestly. I was like, okay, I'll ask my class, and right now it's only physical therapy students, and so I'm a second year, and I was, uh, sent out a message to my class, I was like, hey, like, I'm gonna be starting a Bible study. If you wanna know more, come through, uh, shoot me a message, and we'll start it up. And then my friends in the first year class sent the same message, like, yeah, I think we got like maybe four or five people that wanna come out. I was like, okay, cool, I think I have like, myself and maybe two other friends, so that'll be cool. And so we met uh, like the second week, or the third week of January was our first meeting. And in our first meeting, we had 17 people show up between my class and the class below me. And it was just really amazing to see. Um, and that, on that first meeting, we kind of set a vision for what we want this Bible study to be. We don't want it, and what we decided on was that we wanted it to be uh, a place where people could come and learn more about God, read the Bible, talk about how they want to implement it in their lives, but also actually do something with what we've been learning, what we're talking about. That way we're not just people that come and talk about Jesus, but never do anything, or we're not transformed or changed by Jesus. So what's been really awesome to see is that uh, it just opened up so many doors for different conversations uh, between classmates, classmates that I never would have talked about Jesus before. I never would have had these conversations about the Bible with them. Um, and I just wanted to share a couple of things that some of my friends have, and classmates have said. And so um, with our Bible study, we just, it's pretty open. It's not like I'm the leader and I'm the one that's like dictating everything. It's more just open discussion. And we have, we pose a question and people will answer these questions and kind of just discuss. And so two of my classmates, um, they both talked about how they're not really well versed in the Bible and they're not super familiar with everything. They didn't necessarily grow up going to church. They would go to church maybe on like the big holidays, but they considered themselves Christian, but they just didn't really know much about the Bible in general, but they knew like a few stories here and there. So as we we're reading through John, uh, these two classmates of mine, I like, opened up and shared with the rest of our Bible study and they're saying, you know, like, I think it's really awesome that we're able to have this Bible study. Honestly, I don't go to church that often, and I consider myself Christian, but I think it's really cool that I'm able to actually dive deeper and dig in with you guys, with my friends and with my classmates and colleagues, and be able to learn more about who Jesus is, and I'm excited to jumpstart my relationship with him again. That was really cool for me to hear because these are two of my actually really close friends that I just have never had this opportunity to talk to them about Jesus. Um, and then another one is, uh, let's see, another friend that I have in the first year class, um, she's just been having challenges because uh, one of her siblings is a drug addict. And so it was able, she was able to share with the rest of our class or with the rest of our Bible study and just talk about that. We were able to encourage her through that. And then another person from the first year class, 
really felt uh, the camaraderie of the Bible study because he's going through uh, almost a divorce or a separation, and he's part of the Mormon church, but he's leaving the Mormon church, and so there's all these crazy different things that are happening in his life, and he was just super happy that we were able to actually have this Bible study that he could have, not just classmates that come around him, but actually have people that he can consider his friends, not just from the first year class, but from the second year class as well. And uh, the last one that I want to share about is uh, one of my friends. Uh, she talks about how when we were going through these Bible studies, uh, she reads with her girlfriend uh, through these different passages. And I think that's really awesome to hear just that she's going with her girl, she's reading with her girlfriend about these passages. And it's really awesome just to see that God's even working through them and working uh, in their lives and opening their hearts to the word as well. And so what's really been awesome to hear and what really makes my heart happy is knowing that this will be passed on to the next class. So before me, there was never any Bible study. I never really had anything that, uh, that was at school that talked about Jesus, no friends. I thought I was honestly the only Christian in my class. But now I come to find out that there's a lot more. And so this is going to be passed on to the future classes of NAU. And I'm, my hope and my dream is that it would become not just a physical therapy Bible study, but a Phoenix biomedical campus Bible study where it could be med students, PA students, occupational therapy students, uh, athletic training, the nurses from ASU, and everyone else. Um, and I just, I, like, I won't know what happens beyond this, but I know that God's going to uh, still be in control, that he's going to take the reins of it and lead everyone through. So uh, if you could keep them in your prayers, keep my Bible study in your prayers, I'd really appreciate it. Um, and I've, I have all these big dreams, and I honestly have no idea how it's going to work, but I know that God's going to work because he always comes through. And so I just want to encourage all of you that even in your small situations at work, at school, wherever it may be, um, start those conversations with your classmates, with your friends, with your coworkers, because you'll never know how God can use you. And you'll never know uh, what type of impact you can actually have with these people that are around you every day. Thanks. So we're going to read chapter Romans, uh, chapter 12, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God, that is which is good and acceptable and perfect. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. And I can now tell that this is definitely turned on. And uh, so um, today we're going to continue in our walk through the book of Roman, <coughs> which, um, as we're well aware, Paul has a, a lot to say, and he uh, challenges us in many different ways. But uh, you heard the first scripture uh, that was read today was only verses 1 to 5, but we're going to be looking through the whole of chapter 12. So um, as you know, my, my goal is to eventually actually finish looking at the book of Romans. And that means you've just got to keep pounding through some significant links of, of Scripture at one time rather than just doing two verses at a time. So um, we're looking at really a Scripture today that many of us, have already considered one of our favorite verses. And uh, even as you look at the first couple of verses there, it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Living sacrifice, um, I was talking with uh, Larry yesterday. 
some about this. There's a wonderful song that's called Living Sacrifice. And if I would had time, I would have prepared that for you today. But it's a, it's a song that goes through that particular scripture just to remind us of the meaning of living sacrifice. A number of years ago, uh, I had a privilege uh, of taking a class at um, Golden Gate Seminary. Now it's called Gateway Seminary. And I uh, was in San Francisco on a beautiful campus. And I have absolutely no idea how those students really could have adjusted to actually studying there because... Uh, it's so easy to just look out over the, the bay and everything. But uh, I had a class with a man by the name of Samuel Tong. And um, I had never heard of Samuel Tong be prior to my moving to Hong Kong. But when I got to Hong Kong, I kept hearing this name come up. And he's one of, um, one of the primary uh, academics within uh, Baptist church life. And Samuel Tong had taught in Taiwan, had been a seminary president in Hong Kong and in Taiwan and all this. He had his doctorate from Germany and had a doctorate from the United States, has all kinds of credentials and this kind of thing. But I kept hearing his people talking about him with great appreciation and respect. And so I, I, I made a particular plan that when I returned to the United States the first time in 1978, having been in Hong Kong a few years prior to that, that I was going to go to Golden Gate, try to get him for a class. And I took him for the book of Deuteronomy. He was an Old Testament professor. And I can still remember getting the class and some of the experiences that I had there because my classmates at the end of the first week pulled me aside and they said, we're not quite getting it. And I said, what do you mean? They said, you seem to actually enjoy this class. And I said, I don't just enjoy it, I love it. And they said, yeah, but... You know, we, every time we try to get him to chase a rabbit somewhere, all he does is answer the question and pulls it right back where he was going. And I said, he's a Chinese professor. What do you expect? And they, they somehow thought that they had this ability to be able to get him off track. And then they could rest a little bit. Their brains could go anywhere they want to. But he was one of those professors that he pounded point A, then pounded point B, and pounded point C. And he was not good. He, he would chase your rabbit and he'd finish it in about 15 seconds and pull right back where he was going. And um, I remember one of the primary topics we had as we were studying the book of Deuteronomy was speaking and talking about the role of the sojourner. And he talked about the sojourner uh, over and over. But basically, his emphasis on the sojourner in the book of Deuteronomy was to say that. There are citizens, there are people who are kind of pilgrimage. They're on a pilgrimage. They're, they're pilgrims in various lands. They, they travel. They're never the primary part of the society, but they're there. They're living there, and they're making a contribution to the society in which they live. Um, it was a very meaningful time for me to try to consider how God works with those kinds of people because to a certain degree, even as uh, Dr. Tong was talking about, in a sense, uh, Christians are all kind of on a, uh, on a pilgrimage. And we're often people that need to remind ourselves that even in this world, we're only guests for a time. And we're not really tied into and controlled by the values of this world unless we choose to put ourselves under those values. This last week... Uh, had a very fascinating experience. Now, you may think there are places in life that you can go and be safe and not have any bother. I, here I was, sitting in a church building, working on some things, and someone knocked at the door. And it was Jehovah's Witness. I'm sorry, I thought sitting in a Baptist church in an office was probably a pretty safe place not to be bothered by Jehovah's Witness. But I was wrong. And so I walked to the door, we started talking, and um, I, I said, sure, well, let's, yeah, let's talk for a second. I thought, this is fascinating that you would choose to come out. And of course, they had no clue who I was. So we were just talking and had a nice little conversation, and they began to give me their spill. It was fascinating to me because they did what so often a lot of us do. They had kind of a memorized text. They had certain points, 
certain agenda, if you will, that they needed to be sure they hit. And they hit this topic and hit this topic. Talked about the 144,000 that will be in heaven and the rest will be left here on earth. Talked about any Christians that will exist. Now that's not a biblical concept. That's their concept of what the Bible says. But it, it, they had uh, numerous things that they wanted to, to share. And I kept listening and thinking, huh, I've read that before. Yes, I'm, you're hitting your points well. Took them off track for just a moment, and I felt that lady immediately pull back in. And they did the same thing that the, the uh, Mormons do, where you always have a neophyte, a learner, that's along with your more experienced individual. And so at the end of it, it was kind of funny because I heard them go outside in the hallway area, and the, the younger one said, boy, that was really good. I love the way you hit all the points. And I thought, yeah, yeah, so did I. I thought that was funny too. I wasn't supposed to be hearing that statement, you know. But it, it is interesting how, how much we, we get people confused. And their perspective, though, was very much that we are a sojourner. We are here just for a temporary time. And, and I did have to admit when they finished, and I actually said this to them. I said, you know, theologically, your understanding of the Bible is not the same as mine. We look at some things in there, and you've kind of twisted it a little bit. Uh, to your understanding and your appreciation and your acceptance. And so we're not exactly on the same page on things, but I do want to say to you, I admire your commitment to your task. I admire your desire to help other people learn. I don't agree with what you're teaching, but I can say that I understand that. And you know, when we talk about being a living sacrifice, as it says it in Romans 12, that's what it's talking about is, are we sold out to the Jesus that we call Lord. We use the word Lord very, very lightly, I'm afraid. But in fact, uh, that needs to be part of our task. I have no idea. I've been thinking about this particular scripture because I love Romans 12, 1 and 2. They're very, very meaningful to me. But it says, uh, at least when I look at this, it says that Paul um, really had a... a a, a clarity of who he was writing to. And I think you and I, when we communicate with us, we need to always consider who it is we're communicating with. And some of the times I, I've, I've watched people trying to tell another person about how to become a Christian. And we use such religious vocabulary, there's no way in the world that person has a clue what we're talking about. We're kind of talking using terminology that's up in the sky somewhere. But, and I have no idea what, what Paul's words, even in our world today, uh, would really communicate to a person who is unchurched. Uh, this morning we heard a testimony from the guy on the screen that was talking specifically about the fact that not everybody really gets uh, all, you know, people, they don't get it because they didn't grow up with that church background, didn't have all this magic vocabulary. We have to be very, very careful. But Paul used a lot of religious terminology. He talks about offering. He talks about being a living sacrifice. He talks about being holy and acceptable to God. He's using terms that a lot of people really, the last thing they worry about when they get up in the morning is, gee, here's another day. I want to be holy and acceptable to God. You know, it's just not our priority. It's not the terminology we use. Uh, if our church is to grow in numbers as well as spiritually grow, we must learn to communicate in ways that don't offend the listeners. You know, for us to be cheerleaders amongst ourselves, to have another activity, to have another party, have another gathering, we all can use the same language and we're okay. But if we're going to invite in new friends, which we want to have come, to have an opportunity to learn about Christ, we're going to have to remember that their vocabulary and their daily experience is not what yours is. And I think that that's one of the interesting things was that Paul was not writing to a secular world. Paul knew his audience. And so it's like in here when you're speaking to a group of Christians, uh, you know, if we certainly welcome non-Christians. We want them to feel comfortable coming in, but they're not exactly the center of the target every week when we're talking. And Paul was focused on writing to the Roman Christians that were, that were there and around him. But uh, he wasn't really focused on the basic people in Rome who did not have any understanding of God. Um, he felt that it was important 
uh, to push them to stop being part of their society's uh, values. He, I guess, if he were in our world today, he would be asking the question, why are you guys so wrapped up on the Me Too movement or the Me Only movement in the world? We've got a world that pretty much when we look at life, it's always a search to see if I go there or I do that or I say that, how's it going to impact me? How am I going to walk away feeling at the end of the day? Was it worth going? You know, if you go for an activity, you know, pe people don't go to Disneyland saying, gee, I'm going to go to Disneyland and be a witness to, for Jesus. They go to Disneyland because they want to have a good time. And they want themselves to feel good at the end of the day. And Paul is saying to them, you know, to be a humble servant, you may have to get some adjustments to happen. And then it goes on, and in verse uh, 2, it uses the magic word as far as I'm concerned. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve that which is God's will. You know, transformation. I remember when I was uh, working and studying on a particular degree back a number of years ago, that we had, there was a, a Dale McConkie wrote a book that was, that, that was uh, quite interesting. It was a kind of a business book, but he wrote one for nonprofits. And I remember at the time, Peter Drucker's writing was very, very popular. Ross Perot was writing a lot of books on business, this kind of thing. But basically, McConkie's book talked about transformational system saying that somehow we've got to understand how a transformational system works is that basically you've got yourself or you have whatever the system is and you have the transformational company here in the middle or the business or the, or the, the structure, whatever it is. And this from the old you, if you will, using Christian terminology, the old you goes into the transformational system, which is the church, now, the church is not, in that sense, just the organization of the church. It's the believers. You are the church. I am the church. This building exists. We give praise for this building because it's a resource to the church, but the church is the people. And so you've got this, this, this old us, this one that lives in society, didn't know Christ, didn't have the direction, would certainly have never had a clue what all Paul was talking about, that goes into the transforming system and then comes out a new person. So the church is supposed to be that, that, that animal in the middle, that machine in the middle, that, that changing body. This morning I had a short conversation with someone regarding next Sunday. Next Sunday is Easter. And the question was whether or not we're going to have Sunday school next week. And the answer is yes. And Roger's going to emphasize that too. We're, we're there trying to remind you. And the reason is not we're bored, we don't have anything else to do. It's that Sunday school is an opportunity for you to work with the Word of God. To ask questions that you don't understand. Think, to give comments about what you read. Sunday school is valuable. I wish they, it was called something other than Sunday school maybe. But the point is it's Bible study. It's an opportunity to allow the Lord to really communicate with our heart and challenge us to change. And so we're going to have that next week, and it is the transformational system. It's an opportunity to come in to wrestle with the truth and then see something new come out on the other end. And so we will want to always support that within our church. But the transformational system that is the church is what Paul is talking about is he's saying, you have to have a new mind. And Paul recognizes, even for this Roman body of people, that they have made a decision to follow Christ, but they still have a challenge because they're still living in a world that has different values than the Christian world. And so he's saying to them, you must be reformed. You must come out and have a different perspective if you're going to truly understand the will of God. So we're, we're looking at a, a major challenge when we talk about what it is to establish transformation. But the point that I would see in the midst of all of this as we look at making ourselves, it requires us sacrificing. It's a choice. Paul says in verse 1 that our choosing to sacrifice our lives is our evidence of true worship. 
You know, we talk in here a lot of times about how we worship and what we can do to worship appropriately. This says that if we make ourselves a living sacrifice, that is worship. We're giving our values, our goals, our plans, our dreams, our identity to God. And that is our value. Our mind's transformation of values and goals and these things is what is called for and what is requested. It's not about us uh, having both the mentality of our life goals and plans uh, that we would be in control of. It's about ourselves placing those goals in God's hands. Uh, when we enter the transformation system of having Christ as our Lord, we must expect and even demand that we will have a, become a changed person. To a certain degree, we must ask ourselves if finding God's will is that important to us. If it is, then the idea of a sacrifice of our lives is, is a reasonable expectation. As we go on and we look, verses 4 to 8, of this same scripture in Romans, talks about gifting. And I don't know uh, how you feel about this, but to me, gifting is a very interesting concept. Uh, it's not saying that some of us are smarter than others, but simply that we have tools in our character and our Christian identity that must be used. It's saying that once we have come out of that system, there's something new that exists. Once we have... Entered it Now, it doesn't mean we're going to pull out and, and leave this church behind because we're going to go ahead and recirculate back through and continue to get new input and continue to grow. But we have learned what it is to be in Christ's hands. Um, uh, it is a concept that says we must learn to find joy in our differences. As it talks about gifting, the emphasis in these scriptures, verses 4 to 8, is to say every person, every Christian has skills and gifts to give to God. And they're not the same. Now that not the same part gets frustrating for some people. For some people, we want everybody to do everything the same way we do it. And then when we start learning that different people have different skills and different uh, valuing on things, it gets frustrating. But according to this, it's saying it's just like our physical bodies where we don't expect our foot to do the same work as our hand. And it's just simply saying both have value, allow them to function and use them in service to God. Paul's way to describe the gifting of the Christian church is to say that this one body is important. You may choose to be humble and say, and we do have people who have said, oh, I'm not, you know, I don't have gifts. I'm not. I'm not that great. I'm just an average person and I don't have any... But that's not what the Scripture says. The Scripture says that we do have gifts. And so, I, you know, I, I can remember this in my own experience. Have you, and you may can think of this. I don't know if you've ever heard anyone in a choir that was standing beside you and you realized, wow, this is great. I know that I can sing better than that. And you think to yourself, man, this guy couldn't sing his way out of a bucket. You know, and you're just trying to think, but he's in the choir, and he certainly is making a joyful noise unto the Lord. And uh, we, we, we get a little, a little shaken by that. But you know, I think that is what, um, what Paul is saying, is that our gifting may be a little different sometimes, and some of us may can sing their way out of a bucket, and some cannot. But finding your gift requires experimentation sometimes. You know, some people, and I've met some of these, their gifting is hospitality. They love to help people. They love to be involved in the lives of others. Whereas another person, that's not even marginally their concern. You know, we, we, we have to be, be evaluative of what are the things that I can do and do well and really use those skills. And let it function in who you are without judgment of others. I had a guy at a church that we, I was in in Vancouver. I got there and um, kept finding this guy just almost everywhere I went. He was always there. And uh, when the church um, uh, was dirty, he was cleaning. When the, uh, the need was for people to hand out bulletins, he was there handing out bulletins. 
he was not uh, currently functioning as a deacon in the church or anything. So he, didn't, he wasn't wearing a hat that said, Hi there, I'm Superman. But I began to question whether or not he was or not because this man was a servant in every way. He was always available. And I knew that if anybody ever gave him a phone call to make a, a visit at a hospital or go and to take care of this particular person or take food to this person in need, he was the first person lined up to go help. And um, his testimony for me was one that just was amazing. But I couldn't quite figure out what his position was in the church. And I started talking to some people about it. I said, you know, I can't go anywhere without bumping into him doing something in service to the Lord. He said, well, here's the story. In history, I said, you know, back, and it was actually at that point, 20 years ago, 20 years, you know, we, we talk about an elephant's memory, you know, <laughs> never forget. Boy, churches aren't doing great on this either. But 20 years earlier, the guy had, um, he was a businessman. He had gotten into an investment. And he had people in the church that began to say, oh, wow, you're really doing well in your investment. We want in. Can we do it? No, no, I, I don't mix church and investments at all. That, we keep that two separate. I just don't do that. Well, his don't do that lasted a while. How long a while is, I don't know. But it, gradually, he succumbed to the, the pressure. And he had a couple of people in the church that put investment in with him. And when they did, everything looked great for a year or two. But then everything went south. And I don't mean to America. It, things just it weren't going well. And so a lot of money was lost. Well, instantly these wanting uh, millionaires that are putting in their investments turn back on him immediately and start calling him names and giving him a hard time about how he hadn't managed their funds well. And so it became a big thing. And for years within the church, he was carrying around this baggage of having not successfully done good business. Now, people didn't seem to pay attention to the fact that he also lost a ton of money. All they knew was they lost money. And that somehow, in their interp interpretation of things, he had challenged them to join his venture when that was not the case. At that point, a lot of people would probably have flown a white flag and left the church. I, I asked some people about it. They said, oh... It was horrible at certain times. And I, I thought, wow, we Christians, aren't we great? We're very human. That means we've got good days and bad days, and I understand the human response. But I asked them about him, and they said, no, for some reason, God worked in his heart and just said, you're here to serve God not to serve man. You're here to serve him in whatever the need is. So whatever you do, do it in joy. Do it with a positive uh, attitude and just be focused on serving the Lord. They said, so for the last 20 years, he's, he's continued in every way to be faithful to the Lord in what he does. You know, staying on track is not always easy. I asked them, I said, well, now, is this because he has certain gifts or something? They said, he has gifts in everything, but mainly he has gift in love, gift in service, gift in a desire to encourage others. They said, he was a deacon in our church. But we felt as a church, not that we were going to punish him, but that we felt that we had to accept his resignation as a deacon because he resigned as a deacon in the church for fear that his testimony would hurt the church. Now, whether he was right or wrong, you can hear the humility of the man. Paul speaks of that humility in verse 3. Paul speaks of it throughout this whole scripture. But as he goes through, he says, use your gifting, whatever it is. And this man's one of those that's given me a challenge and, a, and certainly a great testimony. You know, if we look in Roman or in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, you can also see another place where Paul's writing to another church. So Paul must have thought this gifting thing was a really big deal. 
And so he wrote even in 1 Corinthians 12, and he mentions some of the gifts that exist, that come from God for man. In the gifting, it mentions faith, knowledge, prophecy, wisdom, healing, miracles, spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues. It gives a list of different ways that God works. Now, I believe the gifts go way beyond that personal. But those are some of the ones to say, these are some examples within the church of things in different ways that God's Holy Spirit continues to work in our lives. Allow these things to change you and impact you. So he mentions it in Romans, and he mentions it in 1 Corinthians. Paul thought it was important that we use whoever or whatever we are as people in serving him. He moves on in chapter 12, and he talks about love. Now, we could also go to Corinthians there to look at the love, love chapter that, that we find in, in Corinthians. But we're looking at Romans today. In verses 9 to 21, he goes through a, a lengthy... And I'm going to go ahead and read this today. It says, Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Wow, I'm going to read that one again. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who... Who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it demands on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take Revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You know... You and I use the word love pretty freely in society and in our world. And we think we know what the meaning of love is. We kind of uh, just drop it around in every conversation. In truth, the word often is misunderstood or misused. The emphasis in verses 9 to 21 is to say that the love of Christ must motivate our behavior and our thinking. Again, we have already allowed the transformation of our mind to begin. Transformation is a daily experience. We have to send it back through the machine from time to time to be sure it's still in good shape and in right condition. The list of things found on these verses all relate to the understanding of God's love in our lives. Sincerity, patience, hospitality, Harmony, pride, the fear thereof and the loss, the need to not have it in our lives. Love when allowed to be part of the sacrificial element that Paul speaks of in verses 1 and 2 can assist us to understand how this massive list of attitudes and actions can become a reality, a living sacrifice. The emphasis is in this particular list that comes between verses 9 to 21 is that our behavior and actions as a Christian must be motivated with the love of Christ. Chapter 12 verses 1 to 8 are kind of a preparation for what you're going to find in verses 9 to 21. Verses 2 and 3 remind us that the will of God should be our primary goal for our lives and the way that we apply all that we are to our lives. If today I was to ask each of you to look at verses 9 to 21 and to list the two 
particular traits that you see as most challenging to implement in your life, I would dare say there would be very few of us who would choose the same two. As you look at what we just found in verses 9 to 21, there are so many things in there that are so difficult, so, so, so challenging. And if we haven't been through that transformational system, if we've not truly allowed Christ to change our mind and our values, we probably would find even more difficulty uh, allowing those things to become at, at, at the guidance point of our lives for our values. Just as our gifting is different within the body of Christ, so are our points of stress in following the will of God. Still, if you're like me, I appreciate having a standard placed before me. Uh, I appreciate the fact that Paul went ahead and laid it out for the church at Rome. Because he told them, he said, this is the way it's got to be. You've got to have people that are committed to the will of God. You have to learn what it is to sacrifice yourself. You have to accept that the church is going to change you. It's going to make you different. We're going to be a little bit strange. We're going to be like that sojourner. We're going to have to accept being a sojourner and appreciate being a sojourner. We're in this world for a short time. The question is, do we enjoy the, the walk, the challenge? Or does it make us feel awkward that we're not like everybody else? As we know, to become a Christian is not to be found without sin. For everyone in this room, we're all sinners. We have no perfect person here today. Forgiveness is not about our successful uh, accomplishing a task or proving ourselves, but it's about what Jesus has done on the cross of Christ. We've got I mean, on, the, on the cross. As Christ was on the cross and what we're going to be celebrating, even this next week, on Friday night, uh, Pastor Jack is going to be uh, leading us in our uh, Good Friday services. It's only going to be about one hour long, but it'll be a service to remind us and to challenge us about the will of God and what Christ has done for us. Then the question on, you know, really, if everything ended on Good Friday, we'd be in trouble. But the good news is we've got Easter that comes after where Christ is risen. So truly, becoming a living sacrifice is our way of worship. How well are you doing in your worship? How well am I doing in my worship? Are his values my values? Do I give all that I am to him? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Paul's message. We thank you that he was bold in speaking to the church back then. We thank you that his words apply to our lives today. We thank you that, that we can see and understand that becoming a living sacrifice is, is a, a challenge for us to give all that we are in service to you. Father, help us to appreciate the role of the church in helping us to go through that transformation of values and purpose and goals. And that from that we would appreciate the gifts that you have given us. Father, help us to learn what our gifts are and then help us to know the joy of using those gifts in service to you. And Father, most of all, help us to understand that love is more than what we see on television. It's more than what our world tells us love is. It requires patience. It requires uh, courage and dependent on you. It requires a forgiveness toward others. Father, we thank you for Paul's message. We thank you for what he has taught us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. I ask you if you would stand.